Fanny gave me a, what I didn't know at the time, a difficult and then it proved to be almost impossible task. I'm supposed to explain to you um, Elmer's thoughts on democracy. He and I, I think Elmer's probably the third live Hungarian I ever met, right? And we have talked about politics on a few occasions, uh, but either I can't remember or it was not sufficiently deeply implanted theoretically that I don't know some of that. So the first thing I did when I agreed, perhaps unfortunately, to accept this invitation was to take the three books of Elema that I happen to have in my private library out in the countryside. <clears throat> and I looked in the index. Not a word about democracy. Then I looked under elections. Nothing. Political parties. Nothing. Authority. Nothing. Power had one citation, but it had nothing to do with democracy, OK? so. There I was. So then I sent an emergency message back to Ferdy and said, please send me something that, you know. He did send me, or he had one of his assistants send me, and there wasn't much in that either. So I decided to plunge into what I had at hand, and then I found it. Brilliantly, I found it. On page 183, of his book on fear and anxiety. Something which I think is very important and it is a dialectical observation. He distinguishes on that page between two forms of rationality and he insists that both are rational. This is the, the genius it seems to me in this. Namely what he calls Promethean which is basically the rationality we think of all the time, that is to say, a rationality based on material advantage and marginal uh, advantage, marginal choice, etc. And the other rationality, which he calls Apollonian, uh, which is based on sentiments, values, symbols, rather than things and material payoffs. And he insists that both are rational. Now, what the implication of this for democracy, especially for what I tend to call not really democracy, but real existing democracy, that is approximately as close to democracy as socialism was to, or real existing socialism was to socialism, the implication is very clear. A stable, viable, legitimate, real existing democracy, liberal, representative, capitalist, uh, I don't know, constitutional, has to deal with both forms of rationality. It cannot be just simply, quote, materially rational. It must also be symbolically, spiritually rational. And that's the problem. We have gotten used to, especially, I must say, academics, unfortunately, uh, this very exceptional period of the famous, the French call it les temps glorieux, the 30 years after World War, the end of World War II, where liberal democracy in Western Europe sort of implanted itself, reproduced itself, and didn't seem to be creating terribly serious problems. And we get the apotheosis of this from dear old Francis Fukuyama, who's declared the end of history in which we're supposed to have arrived at liberal democracy and no more political problems will exist because liberal democracy is the neck plus ultra of legitimate political forms. There. Now, Francis was right. We did end, or we did arrive at an end of a period of history. What he forgot to tell us was that the next period was going to be much worse and more tumultuous and difficult for liberal democracy rather than its triumph. It was its, in a sense, new crisis. And this, I see, Elmer exists. I mean, there's a very clear uh, expression in his work of, the, of crisis. And he has also, Elmer, I was a little bit surprised because in our conversations, he, I didn't hear this, but then I read it. And Elmer was an optimist. I didn't think so. I mean, from some of our 
conversations. I think we both lamented a lot of things. But anyway, he turns out to believe, as many do, that crisis is opportunity. We all know the famous, you know, the Chinese character for crisis is the same character as for opportunity. That's a, okay. So he seems to and concluded in some of his work that, yes, we're in crisis, but the crisis is an opportunity to produce somehow a better. Now, here's where the problem begins. Because for Elamir, the unit of analysis is not the political regime. It's civilization. Now, I come from a discipline which doesn't even like to use the word civilization. I don't trust the word civilization. When people say Western civilization, I think they're trying to hide something, right? So I don't. <laughs> so civilization for me has never been a unit of analysis, too much variation within these categories. And, right? and this famous clash of civilizations of <laughs> you know who, anyway, is again one of those self fulfilling prophecies, perhaps. Anyway, this distinction between two forms of rationality, clearly what has happened is that we have become less and less Promethean and more and more Apollonian. Right? So all of a sudden, the Apollonian side of political authority, namely the importance of values and the importance of symbols and identification especially, is increasingly important. Okay, so And we're not prepared for it. Because this famous 30 years, we've had such an unusually tranquil kind of stable democracy in Western Europe and North America, let's say, but even a few other places, that we forgot this other side of rationality. We forgot the necessity that democracy must produce people with, whoop, with some kind of viable sense of being, of identity, of fulfillment, or, or whatever it is. And we just assumed that if you produced enough material goods, and well, that would be sufficient to keep it going. Now, I was prepared for this, because in my work, right from the beginning, I've been something of a slavish follower of Albert Hirschman. I don't know how many of you are familiar with a brilliant book by Albert called The Passions and Interests. That's exactly what I, I never asked Ellen about Albert, but I don't know if they knew each other or read each other or whatever, but in any case, that book is about the way in which the concept of the pursuit of self-interest without regard for anybody else became, so to speak, the dominant theme, certainly of economics, but also infiltrated the literature on politics, right? And that that was supposed to be the end of history. You just had to need a bunch of self-serving people whose material interest would be clearly to perpetuate this class-based uh, democracy and everything would be fine. Okay. But Albert then reminds people that there's still passions, right? And so what we're looking at now is a new form of expression of passionate intensities, but concerns with specific kinds of problems that cannot be resolved simply by distributing material goods to people. You have to distribute some sense of meaning to their collective existence. And there we have Donald Trump. Now, I admit in the case of Trump, there may be a strong element of sheer irrationality because of some rather peculiar personality characteristics, but not all of these populist politicians are as bizarre and erratic as he is. Some of them are perfectly rational human beings, and, but they're following and they're responding to a different form of demand, a kind of the other side of this dialectic of passions and interests, or Apollonians and, 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 uh, and Prometheans. Now, I had some ideas in here about how you might resolve that. One minute, OK. Historically, the instrument for resolving this conflict has been political parties. Political parties both protected, promoted the material interest of particular followers, usually along class lines on that famous left-right uh, continuum, but it also provided people with an identity and some kind of ideology or program that implied future, not perfection, at least improvement. Right? Political parties 
they haven't disappeared. They can't disappear because you need them for elections. But in people's minds, political parties have literally evaporated. My favorite example, because I live in Italy. At one point in survey research, um, it was revealed that with the possible exception of the Greeks, the Italians had the highest level of party identification of any Western democracy. 85% of young Italians knew the political affiliation of their parents. Now, that didn't mean they necessarily followed, but they knew it. They were, you know, the family talked about politics, and you knew whether your family was communist or socialist or liberal or Christian Democrat. Today, that's less than 25%. Now, that's dramatic. That suggests that the normal mechanism that political parties used historically to pass on from one generation to another a kind of has literally disappeared. People don't have that kind of memory anymore. And as I say, in the European country, which had the highest level of it, so to speak, obviously the greatest fall. So the question becomes twofold. One, can we revive political parties? Is there a formula, a possible set of reforms that could make political parties meaningful to people again? Or two, can we replace political parties? Can we invent some new forms of representation? And here there's a certain amount of noise on the changing technology of politics which suggests that maybe you can use electronic means of communication to produce or to nominate candidates and to conduct elections without political parties. So I leave you with that. But the important thing is I found this brilliant because this was, I think it's exactly the kind of distinction we need to be thinking about in order to face this really major crisis in the nature of Western democracy. Okay.